Hello and welcome to Skander Knits. My name is Ellie and I am a Norwegian living and knitting in London. And you can follow me on Instagram. I am Skander there and you can find me on Ravelry as the designer Skander Knits. And you can join my Ravelry group Skander Knits which is the best place to take part in knit alongs, get pattern support, get in touch, talk and join my little community on Ravelry. And yeah, welcome to the podcast. Welcome back if you're a returning viewer and hello to you new viewer out there. Uh, new viewers, I hope there are more of you. Uh, it's so nice that you have come to my little corner of YouTube. I mainly just have a little talk show here about knitting. It's not a knitting class or anything, although I am sometimes kind of educational as a post, but yeah, it's mainly just a talk show where I talk about the stuff that I knit for myself and for others and uh, designs that I make and other sort of nitty shenanigans that happen in my little room here in East London. I want to say right at the front of this very episode that I am doing vloggist this year. I have never done vloggers before. I have done vlogmas once and that was fun. And I thought, you know what, vloggist, surely that's going to be a thing. And it is a thing. And I think it's going to be really fun because I will get to show, oh god, we have a lot of uh, cloud situation today, they're coming in and out, so my light is completely unreliable and I could have turned on my studio lights and I might if I go properly mad from this. But yes, as I was saying, I'm doing vloggers this year, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I have already started, so the first episode is already up. I am a few days ahead of you guys just because I need to keep sane. So you may notice that things are a little bit out of sync, but at least the days are in the right order, okay? <laughs> so yes, the first episode went out today. Well, I don't want to call them episodes because they aren't part of the podcast. They are literally just little snippets of every day of uh, my life in uh, August. So I do want to make it absolutely clear to anyone who follows this podcast that if you feel a bit like, oh, I don't really, I can't keep up with all this stuff, really, all the knitting stuff that you feel like you need to keep up with will be covered on this podcast. So it's not like you have to watch the vlog. It is purely bonus content for those who would like that kind of thing. And so you're not missing out if you kind of opt out of the whole thing. That's absolutely fine and understandable. We can only spend so much time, com you know, consuming stuff online and that's perfectly fine just want to say that so also if you do expect knitting content there then you might be a little bit disappointed because that's not really where I put the knitting content I put that here having said that though the first video of vlog vloggist I might accidentally call it vlogmas vloggist uh, the first video does cover my visit to Fiber East which I will touch more upon later in this episode as well but yes it was a little bit knitting specific that one but they may not always be and they're not supposed to be so I am the hostess of two, and very, very soon, at the end of this video, three, three, not the other hand, knit-alongs. <laughs> I am hosting the year-long knit-along, which is where we aim to make six pairs of colourwork mittens for the duration of 2018. I have not started a finished objects thread for that on Ravelry just yet. I had some people ask me. The reason being is that, well, we're not near the end of 2018 yet. So, I mean, if you have six pairs ready already, by all means take photos, but I'm not going to open a thread until we are probably in December. Because the thing that happens a lot is that some don't understand or read the rules, so they will post single pairs of mittens. And I will have to tell them that no, only full collections are permitted, because I really do want you guys to make six pairs, and that's the the entire point of the knit along. Um, so I just wanted to make that absolutely clear. However, a finished object thread that I have started now is for the skein deer sock along that will end at the end of August. So you can now post photos of your finished pairs of socks there. I recommend and ask you to post one post per pair of socks. So if you have done several pairs of socks, I ask you to post them in separate entries because then you will get an entry in price draws for each pair because there isn't any limit as to or a minimum as to how many pairs you need to make so and the rules for that knit along is just to knit any pair of my uh, colorwork sock patterns that I have on my Ravel in my Ravelry store <laughs> I can't talk today and the reason being is that I am a little bit nervous because I am launching right now the second Serbian Mitten Club and I'm so excited 
it was so much fun last year and I decided to repeat the success and it makes me very nervous and that's probably why I'm so fussed about all the light situation and everything. I even had to rewatch the last year's uh, video announcement because I was like, what did I even do? What was that all about? And I realised, actually, for those of you who wasn't part of that last year and for those of you who kind of want to, you know, be a bit nostalgic, I'm going to tell you the story of the Sarbe Mitten Club and kind of the story of this very podcast. So when I had done this podcast for maybe oh, less than half a year, a couple of months, I'd been asked by a local yarn shop here in London to do a colour work class um, but I was asked to do a kind of Norwegian specific one because there were really already colour work classes here in London what I've been asked to do was something yeah more Norwegian and I thought well what can we do in a Norwegian colour work class like we won't have time to do a, a B C D and I tried to think and the most obvious thing seemed to be colour work mittens and I tried to find free patterns that we could use and I wasn't sure if I was allowed to and I ended up actually just deciding something and I said just decide something. I didn't design much at the time but I had a pretty good grasp of colourwork mittens after having made several from so many different designers so I cast on, experimented with the stitch count and the length and completely worked it up from scratch and came up with these, the Salva mittens that I believe now are the most popular colour work mittens on Ravelry, which is crazy. It's absolutely, yeah, no, um, at least they're in the top tier, I don't know. <laughs> These are made in Susan Crawford Exelana DK, in case you're curious, but yeah, they are made in DK weight yarn, and I think that was the big kind of untouched territory that these Norwegian type mittens had not really been released in a format that was quick to work out and written in a way where you could easily get how they were made. Uh, Norwegian patterns are very much often of the kind where they will tell you roughly how to do the calf, like, you know, cast on X amount of stitches, work rib for this small length, that's kind of how they're written, and then it says knit from chart. And I understand that's a bit intimidating, so I thought, you know, I'm gonna write out what you're gonna do each row all the way up and it seems to have been something a lot of people have been looking for because it got very popular when I finally decided to put this pattern on Ravelry after I had taught my classes because people watching this podcast just wanted to try it themselves even though they couldn't attend classes here in London and I started a little knit along I had several people taking part that made this pattern so many times I thought it has a shame, I could knit so many different mittens. So I started charting out more mittens and I suddenly had all these designs and I thought, oh, we could do like a bundle, that would be cool. And then I thought we could make it into a, a subscription club. So each and every month you could get a new mitten pattern. And at the time I had the idea, I kind of put it off a bit because I just had a lot of things going on and I, in the end, decided to launch it last August and I just held up a pile of these and just said, this is the mystery. And so many people just had so much faith in it, they bought the bundle even though this was the only pattern added to it. Because you, if you don't know, uh, with Ravelry you have to have a pattern in a bundle, a ebook, a collection to sell that collection. So I just decided to, okay, we're going to put this pre-existing pattern in there already. This is the two sizes they come in. A bit of an easy fit and a bit of a snug fit. They both fit me, but I will say I, I'm more comfortable with this one. But it's nice to have options. Um, and yeah, so many people showed how much faith they had in my design. Thing at the time, at the time I really didn't have that many designs out there even and that was just such a vote of confidence and it was just so much fun and the main thing was that most people who took part in this had never made colour work mittens before and for most of them it was yeah their very first colour work mitten knitting experience and so many people are now feeling so empowered and able to tackle pretty much anything colour work and I don't really have words for that. 
So yeah, these were the initial mittens that came out. They are, yeah, quick knit DK weight mittens. Fairly straightforward to understand. And the September mittens, I was super nervous. I thought, oh, people are just gonna feel like they're getting the same thing all over again. They were received so, so well, and that's Mia Bunton. These are named after kind of the administrative center of the village Sarbu. And the village Sarbu is a village from fairly close to where I'm from, it's about an hour drive and they are world known for this particular mitten style. So all the mittens in my collection are inspired by that mitten style. Um, it's just something that's very near and dear to my heart and I suspect to a lot of Norwegians' hearts. Um, so yeah, Mebun came out. And they sort of serve the same role as these. They are also fairly intuitive and easy to make. In a way, maybe this chart was a tad bit easier to follow, but then again, this chart couldn't be any easier. So they kind of became a very natural continuation for people to develop their skills and confidence. At least I've been told as much, and oh, it just makes me very giddy of excitement. And then the Nea mittens came out, and they're quite different. They have, first of all, I decided to invert the cuff, which gave it a, a very interesting look. I used actually a pattern that is supposed to be horizontal and used it vertically, and I added some extra stitches so that actually it could even fit a small male hand if you just knitted to bigger than what the pattern says, you know, by going up needle size. And it was just really fun to experiment with that. And yeah, I really like them. This is the palm side, so things got up, you know, one notch, got a bit more exciting. Uh, gosh, I forgot to mention the yarn I used for these. There is such a variety of yarns that you can use. I'd, obviously, I'd used Susan Crawford Exelana here. I had used black yarn, Falkland Merino, or Falkland Swan, I think they call it which is by far the softest yarn in the entire bundle. Here I have used um, Navia Trio, and here I'd used Serbu, uh, I forgot what it's called, but yeah, it's just called Serbu yarn. Uh, I think it's something by Sunnes that they sell in the yarn shop in Serbu and a couple of other places. And then I released another pair of mittens in Navia Trio, which is such a good yarn for these mittens, I have to say. And these are the Flora Mittens, and they're one of my personal favourites, and I think they were the most popular uh, mittens from the entire club. And certainly going by how they have performed kind of individually on Ravelry after I split up the collection. And yeah, they, I just, oh, and they remind me of the house I grew up in as a kid because of the colours it chose. I don't know, weird anecdote, but there you go. So there we have it. And the last pair of mittens were perhaps my personal favourites. Yeah, I just have a soft spot for these. These are the Quello mittens. They are named after one of the oldest farms in Serbu. And I just love the kind of, yeah, very old look of them as well. The intricate pattern. How you kind of need to keep your head a bit more straight with these than the others. And they were released in that kind of logical order of how much brain space you can devote to colour work mittens as your colour work confidence and experience goes up per pair of mittens. And that was a lot of fun to do. And I'm like, how can I possibly replicate that? But of course, the question isn't really about how to how to replicate. The question is, how do I do it differently? And I have changed things up a bit for this year's club. I've decided to keep the more stepwise advancing format, but to do it in a slightly different way. So whereas last year I went from less advanced to more advanced in terms of colour work chart intricacy, and this year we are going to go from thicker, i.e. heavier yarn weights to finer yarns as we go along. And that was quite a challenge because it's quite hard to please everyone with that because so many people love last year's club because of how quick and easy all the mittens were and I totally agree I think that's one of the things that are that's so much fun with knitting these I mean I'm, I knit them myself and that's the big incentive right they are amazingly quick so I wanted to keep that whilst at the same time having this continuous challenge of making people feel more and more empowered to make more advanced mittens and I certainly got to see how people were able to do that last year because 
alongside the mitten club i did release the pumpkin spice mittens and the yudabuk mittens and the yudakvel mittens and these were all very tightly knit fingering weight mittens that i quite frankly thought there's no way people can do that but i'm gonna release them just for fun i kind of want them to be out there and if people don't want feel like they're ready to knit them well it's fine it's just the thing i want to do and i think because of the mitten club people just had gotten the confidence to do it and i hadn't said a word about them being beginner friendly but because the mitten club was people just kind of thought okay beginner friendly i'm gonna try these really densely knit very intricate color work mittens that i would really not call beginner friendly and beginners did them and they did them like that and that taught me so much and it's something I'm trying to bring on board in this club. So what we're gonna do is kick things off with an iron weight pattern. So that will be kind of the bonus pattern for this year's club, same way that the Selber Mitten pattern was the bonus for last year's. So that's just to kick things off, to have something in the bundle when you buy it, because something has to be there, of course, according to Ravelry's rules. And then we're gonna proceed to our usual comfortable DK weight zone. So that will be the case both for September and October and I will as ever recommend a three ply yarn from Roma but I will also speak highly of Susan Crawford's Exelana DK and Navia Trio. Those are my top three recommended yarns if you wanted any but there are many yarns I could recommend for the DK weight and I do have a bundle for that on in my Ravelry favorites from last year so you can definitely explore that if you want to prepare for what yarn to use right now and all the yarn that I like to use for this kind of thing are highly affordable I don't necessarily think that there's a relationship between how much yarn should cost and how good it is there are lots of really good commercial yarns out there that use rustic yarns in both worsted weight, iron weight, DK, four ply sport, what have you that was an awkward order to list them but hopefully you get what I mean uh, so after we've gone through DK, we've got three pairs of mittens then that are fairly straightforward and quick. We are going to venture into sport weight. They're not going to be very different from DK, but they're going to sit somewhere between DK and a more fingering weight kind of gauge. So yes, they are going to be sport weight. I am going to use Susan Crawford's Exelana four ply for that. Um, that may sound a bit confusing to some of you because surely that's not sport weight right well sport weight interestingly is not really a yarn used on this side of the pond so much it's a kind of american thing and so often what is classified as sport weight in america actually fingering weight or four ply extends all the way that way so i'm just talking about the gauge that these mittens in it with the stitch count that we have essentially so you can use fingering weight and four ply sport weight all of that for the last two pairs of mittens because the last pair of mittens it's going to be in a more four ply gauge so if you've done the pumpkin spice mittens the yulekvel the yulebuk or any of those or um snövotte for instance then you probably know what you have yourself set up for and if you feel like those are a little bit too advanced for you then that is my objective with this club to uh basically prepare you for that and make sure that you have all the skills the tools the whatever you need to have to do those mittens and i'm very excited to see that and yeah apart from that we are sticking to the selby look it's so like i said near and dear to my heart uh it's one of those things that make me feel a bit closer to home given i live in a foreign country that isn't norway uh yeah not sure if I will be going with the Selby look every club in the future so this might be the last Selby club I don't know we'll see um but I'm very excited to do it once more and what is really exciting of course is that this is not just a subscription club it is also a knit along yes so I won't be having a knit along per pattern I will have it for the entire collection so you don't have to make every pair you can make just an iron weight pair one time or five times you will have one entry or five entries it's really up to you one pair of mittens is one entry essentially so if you want to make all five mittens then by all means but if you wish to i don't know just do a couple of them then you can do that there is no minimum requirement uh, well the minimum is one pair if you want to take part uh so yeah 
I am gonna kick things off with the iron weight mittens so they are already made and they will look very familiar to you because they look like this I'm gonna hold them up next to these the saddle mittens and I'm sure you're wondering what on earth <laughs> these are the iron weight mittens they are so fast to make so these maybe from cuff to tip minus the thumb will take me a fairly long evening to make maybe a bit quicker now i'm quicker now than i was last year these i can do in one sitting right and i understand i knit faster than most people but yeah i just thought okay we have these they're fairly entry level and easy but can we make them even quicker and holy moly these are so fast first first we kick off things with the ribs so you actually don't have to jump straight into the color work. I did that for these mittens because they were made for a class so we could really just focus on the cuff to get into color work. Here is a little bit of a different format. We have actually two cuff lengths. This is a shorter version but the pattern will also have one for the longer that adds basically this much. So it's a bit longer. I would have done that probably had I known I had enough yarn. Hindsight, I did. So I have used uh, Green Mountain Spinnery for this. This is their weekend wool. I believe they classified a word as worsted, but again, iron weight, not so much used overseas as here. Worsted, not so much used over here. I would say this is definitely an iron. And other yarns you could use is Vamse um, or PT3, as it's also known as from Roma. You could use probably Letlope from Istex, I should think. Um, both Jameson's and Jameson Smith have wor iron worsted yarns. They, they call them both, they're kind of considered the same in the UK, it's a bit strange. Uh, so you can use that, but I really, really did enjoy using the Green Mountain Spinnery yarns. I have kind of used the same sort of sizing format, so this is the small, this is the large here, so you can see kind of how they differ, not super much, but this, these are quite snug on me, so they will fit, but there is a larger size as well, if you want more wriggle room, which I certainly do prefer. So yeah, these are just the bonus mittens of this particular collection. Same as these were the bonus for last year. So I just thought, yeah, why don't why don't we make some really, really simple and easy ones that are for anyone. Even if you didn't take part in last year's club, these will be just easy entry level for sure. And if you have any doubts or questions or anything, you can reach me and everyone who's taking part and maybe even took part last year in my Ravelry group. And it's gonna be threads to talk about this, to help each other out. And yeah, it will be the same buzzing community that is always in that group. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, there we have them. Guys, I love Green Mountain Spinnery so much. And I'm really excited to have used a yarn easily accessible in America, because I know a lot of you are from there, but I do, like I said, have a list of yarns that you can use from Norway as well. I think Fleeted Scarn from Sunness should work out beautifully also, and that is easily accessible both here and in Norway. So lots of lots of little things that you could use there. I'm gonna see if I can set up bundles on in my Ravelry favorites for each of the yarn weights that I'm going to be exploring. I will say that first pair of mittens, most iron and heavy worsted will go. For the the other two, the DK weights, anything in that bundle on my Ravelry page will be good. And for the last two pairs, anything in the bundle I have for mitten yarns and fingering weight yarns, I'll link to it below. That should go as well. So there we have it, kicking things off with the first pair of colorwork mittens from the Serbia region. So that is mostly it, apart from, of course, the price. The retail price for this entire bundle is, same as last year, £18. But until the club actually kicks off, when the mystery comes, I will be charging for the early birds, £14. So you'll get a £4 discount, essentially a whole mitten pattern for free if you buy the bundle up front before the mystery patterns start coming out. So hopefully that is something you guys will be interested in. And I, yeah, gosh, I am so, <laughs> I'm flushing. I'm so nervous about this. It's been something I've anticipated for the entire year. And it's like, yeah, it's just one of the highlights of the year for me right now. Um, 
really have enjoyed this last year and I want to take a bit of a moment to thank you all for that experience because as some of you who have followed me for a long time will know a very rough period of my life started around that time. It was really bizarre that that Ugh, where am I going with this? That the really positive and the really negative happened in my personal life at the same time. And I have to say that Mitten Club was what kept my head over water. And it's, it sounds very bizarre, so maybe I'll just leave it at that. But thank you, it really does not go underappreciated. So yeah. so yeah, early bird price is £14. You don't need a quote for that. I'm going to just move swiftly on there before I start crying. I have knitted stuff. Yes, we're going to go into whips. I haven't knitted much that I can show. Obviously, there's a club coming. Need I say more? <laughs> but I have knitted more on my tenure. And the progress I've made is entirely uninteresting because, because it's just more stocky net. <laughs> it's just more stocky net. It, oh my days, so much stocky net. And I think I may have knitted a little bit too much. Yeah. I think I was supposed to reach 40 centimeter if memory serves me right and we have more than that but I did also say I want to add a bit extra length so that is actually fine I think you know what it's fine it's fine I'm gonna be ready to divide into the armholes soon and then this was this is gonna look a little bit differently the next time we look at it but just to kind of repeat myself from when I first cast this on, I am using Volmeiser Lace, which I am arguing is more of a light fingering weight because I apparently disagree with all kinds of yarn weight classifications. <laughs> and yeah, I am knitting it a tad bit tighter than the pattern suggests, just because that's what I like. And it is a finer yarn, so that makes sense. And we'll see how that works out when we get to the arms because that's when I'm gonna have to switch my brain on and figure out how on earth is that gonna all work out because obviously changing the gauge doesn't just change stitch gauge as we touched upon the last episode it will also affect row gauge and row gauge is you know the very armhole and so I'm gonna have to wrap my head around that armhole that sounds very acrobatic but yeah uh, just to figure out how that's gonna work and I've heard that people say that the armholes of the pattern are relatively snug compared to the rest of the garment that is quite of a positive ease obviously uh, so I'm gonna have to take that into account as well. Another pattern that has received quite a bit of love this week that again I was surprised that I was continuing with this thing but that is the Jadeite cardigan by Orsa Tricosa who is the author of the Ziggurat book and the inventor of the Ziggurat construction method and if you're curious about that I have talked about that in the I believe episode before last and um, so I'm all about this method but also, um, Fruity Knitting did an interview with her in their latest episode, so you can hear more about that there as well. I am so happy that finally this pattern construction method is coming out to people more, because it's really so much better than the one we've been sticking to for a long time now. I'm just going to say it, I think it's better. And I think it has so many possibilities, and especially now that I'm looking into how to do it with steaks. Yeah, but this one is knit flat, so never mind what I said about steaks, that will come later. And... I am on the second sleeve. First sleeve I finished relatively quickly with that little green wedge. It is green. A lot of people say it's grey. It's green. Can't you see it's green? <laughs> uh, so I'm ready for the wedge soon. I'm going to start knitting. I have already knitted back and forth actually. The wedge is, if not done, it's nearly done. And then, well, the wedge, but well, the wedge is going to go in. It's nearly ready. Then I'll just join in with the, the green yarn just green and then I will do the eye cord for the for the cuff yes it is finished off with an eye cord and I think that's really really nice I quite like that I always put ribs up my cuff and it's like getting a bit monotonous monotonous, monotonous. uniform a bit same same yeah so I like having to try so I like getting to try something a bit different and yeah I love sorry it's all jingle bells are now with the needles <laughs> I really love this yarn this is joe sharps i can never remember what it's called it's a merino tweed yarn with a little bit of silk and cashmere in it not that i really can tell it seems mostly like merino to me but there we are and it's just nice i love this charcoal tweed this is something i will be wearing so so much i can already i just have to put this down now because it's just all yeah needles clacking everywhere and i am using fairly thick metal needles i think we are using 
the royal we are using a 5.5 so they are noisy needles i'm not gonna lie so we are actually left with acquisitions that was a very very fast whip section i have been knitting some other stuff of course but uh for various reasons not something i can show you one because one of those things are, it's not even a design it's just a bit of a surprise we like surprises yeah no anyway i have been to fiber east as i said earlier and gosh that was a really good day and i went there fairly early with my neighbor and fellow podcaster nikki of the tea and possibilities podcast and we headed up there and met up with the amazingly pregnant <laughs> katie of inside number inside number 23 and the lovely and amazing amy of the stranded podcast who's finally returned in her jet lagged self from tennessee and we are very glad to have her back <laughs> and it was such a good day honestly i'm so glad to be catching up with this really fun trio and yeah fiber east is honestly one of my favorite yarn events of the year not really because of what is being sold there because it is actually one of those yarn events where i'm able to control myself the most it's not where i feel the need to buy 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 although there is some it is just where it's so easy to just go up there from here where i live i can just spend the day there and i will meet people who are absolutely awesome so close to home and relax and it's such a good place it's lots of space they have sheep uh i absolutely just love going there i i don't really know how to put it into words it just it's not too big it's not too small it's worth going to it's it's different from a lot of the other yarn shows as well and i can't really quite put my finger on it but yeah i highly enjoyed it i loved seeing people i haven't seen in a while and uh, fiber east so yes, I will be having acquisitions that are mostly from Fiber East, but there are some that are from before and uh, related. I will tell you when we get there. <sighs> One bundle of yarn that I got right before Fiber East are these skeins from Easy Knits. So I am making a pattern. I'm not going to announce for who just yet, but uh, we agreed to use Easy Knits yarn. So he shipped off this yarn for me fairly quickly this is on the squidge base which is spun by john arburn so you already know that's good it's a 80 percent new zealand polworth <laughs> and 20 percent merino a particular merino i'm not going to pronounce that it's got 330 meters per 100 grams still classified as four ply though i would say sport but again as i said we don't really operate with sport here so much quite traditional you know and yeah so i love the colors i selected for this particular design we're gonna see how that will pan out i have no idea how but i just love this combination so much oh the colors are so beautiful and bright and i want to do them justice and i'm kind of freaking out but anyway it's a design you will probably see fairly soon it's not the biggest in the world it's not it's for an event coming up i can say that i can say that so that is that i absolutely love this yarn completely i was having to control myself so much from buying a sweater quantity of this when i saw it in fiber east as well but i realized ellie you just got four skins in the mail just pull yourself together <laughs> so yeah this is for a design commission that we will be seeing later and i need to really get on that and now for stuff I actually got at fiber east as we all know Amy is my personal yarn mule. <laughs> uh, she did ask if uh, I wanted her to get me anything from when she went to the SSK retreat yarn event. And I said, well, if you do see the Fat Squirrels booth, I would like some bags. And uh, she sent me a photo of the booth and I immediately clocked this particular bag, having no idea how huge it is. And I love a big bag. And she got it for me and it's just the best thing in the world oh my god i love this so much this is enormous and fabulous and oh i love it so much i honestly i've seen lots of people have fat scroll bags on other podcasts and it's always given me the impression that it's of such a high quality they always look stellar well interfaced strong sturdy Noth I can't see anything wrong with this and as someone has just dabbled into sewing it's nearly frustrating to see something as perfect but there we have it I don't know how people do this but I am so glad that I have this and thank you so much Amy for going to the other side of the planet to retrieve one for me 
I also love how the zipper and the handle is one and the same. Yeah. Yeah. So there we have that. I don't know what else I have to say. So Fat Squirrels, uh, Fat Squirrels, why do I keep saying that? Fat Squirrel is both a podcaster and bag store and you can find her on YouTube and you can find her on her website to get her bags at fatsquirrelfibers.bigcartel.com and I think my uh, jadeite dyed cardigan is going to have to live in this because I need to use it right now and we all know I absolutely don't need to cast on anything new. Uh, you may have seen glimpses of what I am wearing today. It is knitting themed and it was something that Amy picked up for me when she went to America that I had ordered there because, well, you want to avoid the fees that you get when you get something from overseas. So she agreed to pick it up for me and this speaks to my metal heart so much. I'm going to show you. Let's take a bit of a step back. What does this even read? Well, most people can't even read it, so it's mostly just amusing for me. But it says, knitting is metal. I love this so much. Oh my god. Ah, uh, so in case you didn't know already, I am a huge metal head. Now, granted, I'm not really that much into the black metal scene, although that's what Norway is mostly known for. Albeit so many people refer to it as death metal, and it's black metal. It's just different. It's subtly different, and if you challenge that notion with any black metal heads they will just be very very miffed i don't really think it's that different but anyway i love this logo so much it's so tongue-in-cheek and hilarious oh it's so good <laughs> it's ridiculous i think it's probably a bit odd for people who don't understand the metal scene and maybe still think of it as a bit of a scary thing honestly as someone who's been in the metal scene since i was 13 and i'm now 28 it is the dorkiest pile of nerds you will ever find. Completely just amazing and harmless and just, yeah. Maybe this is because I'm more in the prog metal scene rather than black metal, I'm saying that. But yeah, this is just fun and I love it. And I just love that I now look like I'm wearing the most grim shirt in the world. But it's a knitting shirt and it just makes me giddy. <laughs> So let's look at it once more because I love it this much. Knitting is metal. And you can find it on knittingismetal.com and I just, I love it so much that I had to get three shirts. Did not realize that they would be this big, so I'm gonna get once more. It goes all the way down to my bum and then some. So it's kind of like a tunic, which means I don't have to wear trousers. <laughs> I say as if I own a single pair of trousers. But I do wear skirts. As much as I love skirts, sometimes I get annoyed when stuff sits in my waist. It's quite nice so I can just wear these long t-shirts and still look fabulous. So I got some other t-shirts as well. I realise maybe they're not to everyone's taste, but I absolutely love them because I love furry animals as much as I love metal and a bit of a tongue-in-cheek humour. So... It's a metal kitty! <laughs> and this tank top's gonna be so in handy because we only have a brief break from the horrendous heat wave that has hit Britain and Europe for the most part. It's been kind of like 23 degrees for the past few days, so it's pretty nice. It's gonna go straight up to 30 at the end of the week and I will be sporting this incredibly vicious kitty that is taking all your skeins and doing whatever with them. So that is one and the other shirt. As someone who is a self-confessed dog lover and just slightly dog obsessive, had to get this. Uh, again, huge, huge t-shirt, absolutely enormous. I guess I will be sleeping in it or something. I don't know. It'll probably be good for the hot weather, weather anyway. Although most of the time in the hot, in that weather, well, I can't talk. Most of the time when it's that hot. I just want to be naked. <laughs> so I don't know when this will be used, but I just love it so much. Honestly, though, I wish I was able to so modify t-shirts because then I would change up so many of my band merch t-shirts that I have around that either are too small or too big, mostly too big because quite frankly, it's a very male dominated scene. And so they mostly just make t-shirts for the guys and the t-shirts that they do make for the girls are 
way too small to fit most of us. Um, so I wish I was able to alter t-shirts actually. That would be a really useful skill. Maybe that's something to put on my sewing goal list. Yeah. So anyway, I am so excited about these t-shirts and thank you so much Amy for bringing them over for me. That was just amazing. I did also buy something off of Amy. This was a while ago, the beginning of July. You may guess what it is. It is indeed Bras Off O'Clock, which is her colorway for the Tits Out Collective. And I love it so much. And it's on her Fjord base, which is really my favorite base of hers. It's 80% uh, Superwash Blue Face Lester and 20% Nylon. So it's a perfect sock yarn. And uh, yeah, very happy to have another edition from the Tits Out Collective. I now have three colorways and I'm expecting a fourth from Nomadic Yarns. But I got a bit excited and ordered something that was dyed to order. So uh, my good friend Shamika may have to bring that over for me. <laughs> Oopsie. So now we are finally into actual Fiberiste purchases. So the first place that I actually ended up buying something of Fiberiste was this particular bag booth. So they made lots of project bags. And apparently I never have enough project bags because uh, I keep costing on things. And these bags, there were so many of them. They were all in so many fun prints and uh, it was hard to choose. And I will say, and I'm saying this in the best way possible, I thought they were severely undercharging because they're just setting up, you know. Uh, so I thought, okay, well, if that's the case, I'm gonna buy two. So I bought two, I got these two. So I'm gonna show you this one first. This is the one with the zipper. It's fairly big. I think they're both sort of sweater sized. And look at that print. It's got lots of little goats. I think they're goats or lambs or something. Trees. And yeah, it's got a really fun pattern in of pattern colour in the middle and on the inside. Ellie, come on. Do you need coffee? <laughs> and it's got a bit of a tassel and I, I just really like it. Honestly, I just I can't have enough bags. That's the case. And when I saw this, I had to have it. I mean, it is, I think, an Alice in Wonderland print. I have seen it on lots of bags and I've drooled after it for the longest time. And now I found it on a drawstring bag. And we all know, <laughs> we all know I love a good drawstring. So that's something that just had to come home with me. <sighs> Guys, I can't recommend this bag maker enough. This is Jibby Roo Sauce. So I'm gonna show you the logo. Yep. So she makes these bags really nice and complete bargain which I feel a bit naughty saying for handmade stuff because I think yeah I don't know I'm just really appreciative of this I, I don't know what to say I think they're really really good and I'm very excited for having snagged two bags of hers because uh, yeah love a good bag Every time I show product bags that I bought and how excited they make me, I think back to when I first started podcasting, I said, oh, I don't really care about project bags, I just use tote bags. And I have a collection of like 50 tote bags now and I don't ever use them. <laughs> yeah, famous last words, Ellie. Young Ellie. Anyway, I've got more things. I went to Pearlescence. I know this isn't all I bought at Pearlescence, but I kept everything in this bag. I bought a bunch of Chargu stuff from Pearlescence. I really do think they are the best source for Chargu things in the UK. So I got this entire handful of things. They're both really changeable and fixed needles. I don't think it's very interesting to go through. You know, I love Chargu. I think they are the most high quality all round needles out there. I would really use my Chargu Red Lace for pretty much anything. The only downside is I do find that they go untwisted sometimes, but that's really about it. I love the needles, I love the cords, I think they're really good. So I just had to up my needle slash a little bit. Added some um, cables for the thicker needles because they are different. I added some short circulars because I like that for sleeves. And I got some more of the needles that I know I use a lot. Oh my god, I nearly forgot this. This is something Amy bought me in Wales. And it's just the best thing because... Well, it's a sheep and I have this weird thing that if I am visiting either Wales or Scotland or preferably anywhere, I need a sheep souvenir. So this guy's gonna get to sit with the other two sheep, one that I got from, I think, Wales and one that I got from Frame and Fiber in New Jersey. So, 
going to the sheep collection. I guess I have a sheep collection now. Oh, and this skein. Guys, I'm not really allowed to buy skeins of stuff if I'm not allowed, if I don't like, if I don't know what to do with them. So, uh, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this, but it's beautiful. Yes. Yes. And it was reduced to half price. And when I see something I love this much, and it's a single digit price, I'm like, okay, it's mine, it's coming home with me. And this is fine merino silk. It doesn't quite say the ratio between the two. And has 630 meters in this 50 gram skein. Uh, how? How? It's so lofty and clearly woolen spun and I just love it and so soft and it can be commercial or whatever you want to be. It's fine. You can wait. You're mine now. Mine. So yeah, just to give you a close up. I'm ridiculous today. Absolutely. Oh, I love this. This is my color. I don't think I need to justify this because you all know. You all know this is my color. Oh, it looks so good in this light as well. I'm just gonna hold this up now until you guys all like go. Are you seeing this now? Is there any other podcasts you wanna watch? Okay, I'll move on. I also got a bunch of Triskillian yarn because he had this like basket of discontinued or at least uh, discounted yarns that had to come home with me. Uh, so I've kind of been saying a few times that I'm kind of over super wash yarn for garments. And then I found this and I'm like, well, you know, gotta have some super wash. <laughs> so, you know, I'm never anti anything. I'm just kind of feeling more non super wash for garments. But I have been looking into knitting the Rocaine sweater that's from Pom Pom Quarterly. And I do believe Amy of the Stranded podcast does want to start a knit along for that in the autumn maybe. Uh, and this I thought was DK weight yarn which is what the pattern calls for although the gate ears towards worsted. And this is sport weight and I don't know if we should go all the way towards sport weight but when I look at the yarn it does look like DK. Doesn't this look like DK to you? It's of the thickness of the wool, the yarn, the strands. Doesn't that look like DK to you? I don't know, I feel like maybe I can push it, but you know what? There's only one way of finding out and that is to swatch. What, what? So yeah, I got five of these lovelies. This is the Geri Ger <laughs> Welsh. That base in the brown colorway. And uh, yeah, got five. Reckon that'll be enough for me. Not that I checked. I got a feeling. Um, and I hope to make the Rocaine. But if not, I guess there will always be something. Because again, I wear a lot of black and dark colours. And I guess one more superwash cardigan won't hurt. So yeah, it is 100% blue face Lester. That helps a lot. Because my issue with superwash is that it does take away some of the good qualities of wool. Like, I feel it becomes more pilly and like prone to fluff and this does that but so much less because it is a blue face Leicester which is a long staple which is just less likely to do that so this I am very fond of even though I got a weight I didn't realize I got I thought it was DK but anyway at least I got blue face Leicester and that is pretty much all I have for this episode. I do want to take a moment to thank you all for your amazing feedback on last week's episode where I discussed gauge and I took a more of a less dismantle some misconception approach. And I was a little bit nervous that uh, some may take issues with that tone but it seems to have gone really well and you know we've had some incidences lately where I have tried to make a uh, a point fairly clear and words have been put in my mouth and I'm like no that's not what I meant oh why can't I be clearer and I think this time just everything was exactly how I wanted it to come across and the conversation has been really quite inspiring and oh I just felt really good about that so I just wanted to thank you for that feedback it did really mean a lot there were two things I did not touch upon uh, well, partially because I forgot and partially because I realized I was contradicting myself. <laughs> so the first thing is the issue of changing gauge. Uh, can you, you know, decide to knit a pattern that has, oh, I usually say 24 stitch gauge, but you want 26. You 
can. I'm doing that with Tenya. I did that with my Siri card again. I am planning on doing that with my... Uh, whenever I get around to cast on another Kate Davies card again, I have one in mind that I would like to knit a tad bit looser, actually. So that's a 26 stitch gauge, and I would like to do 24 because I just know that I like that. <laughs> and you can do it, like I said, but if you do it, you are throwing off the entire pattern, and it's a huge risk because everything will change. And I'm going to try to explain what I mean by that. When I design garments, the first thing I do is open up my spreadsheet. The first thing I put into my spreadsheet is the gauge. The first thing that goes in, I will write 2.4 for the entire row. That is the number of stitches per centimeter. Uh, you can time that by 10 to get it per 4 inches or 10 centimeters. It just works out with the way I do the math. And then I will add the sizes, I will add the bust measurements, either based on just how much I want them to vary apart from one another, or by maybe the, the stitch repeat, the chart repeat. That comes after. And then I will base everything upon that gauge. Everything upon that stitch gauge, everything, every stitch count, I will then divide by the gauge so that I know how many centimeters that becomes. And that's what makes the schematics. Everything is based on that. And yeah, you could say, but if you go up and gauge down in size and all that stuff, then you will just get different. You will have to do all that, all those maths. You will essentially need to get it perfectly right. Another spreadsheet, put that in and see what that changes when you put in a different gauge. Because if I took my spreadsheet and I changed the gauge at the very top row, every number would change. All of it would change. So I would... I don't, I'm not going to discourage you from changing gauge because we had a whole knit along around changing yarn weight and we may do another one around changing the gauge I think it's a really useful skill but it's very important to understand how that alters everything because it throws off row gauge too when you change stitch gauge uh, so the answer is fairly ambiguous like yes you can do it but also you will be changing everything I think that's the message here uh, I just want people to understand that gauge is really at the very core of a pattern and if you are changing gauge then that is what's changing. And the reason I'm talking so much about this is because that seems to be what people think they need to do when they can't get gauge with a given needle size. I think you'll be better off just changing the needle size. Really? Just... Yeah. Because uh, then you can just knit according to the pattern. You're just adapting to your own tension. That's that's, I think, the best way forward is the simplest way to do it because it's never the case that you should just read off the needle size in the pattern and use that because the pattern says so. I know. Um, so, hopefully, that became a bit clearer. It was just something I forgot to mention. And the other thing I didn't touch upon was the issue of blocking because I realized that's where I was contradicting myself a little bit. I, on one hand, and someone's asked me, why do you stretch out your socks when you block them? And I said, well, because you, that's what you do when you block, you stretch out. And then someone said, oh, you know when people think that blocking is stretching, you shouldn't always stretch out your blocking. And I'm like, yeah, totally. And I realized that's not, I don't know. And I realized why I feel kind of contradictory there. It's because when I say finished a garment or anything big, I will just soak it in water and dry it and I will dry it flat usually and that's enough because I think the weight of the entire thing does enough of the stretching that even if it's drying flat the weight of it just by handling it a little bit with water and all of it just that's enough whereas when I've made a sock I would like to stretch that out over my sock blocker because as we all know socks stretch out with wear and the point of blocking is to bring it to the point it will be after wearing. That is why we block, is to get it to look finished, finished, finished. And that is why I don't believe in overstretching blocking a shawl, because it will just like creep up again after wear. And that is the, where, the kind of goal of the blocking, right? So overstretching is sort of going a bit beyond that. And I don't quite see the point when it's not going to stay that way. Um, Maybe that's just me. I think there are different opinions there and that's fine. So I think the main reason why I feel the need to stretch block 
things like mittens and socks but I don't see the point of doing that with garments and to a limited extent with shawls is because with socks and mittens you work in a short circumference and with a short circumference things become a bit uneven and to accommodate for that unevenness actually a good stretch is what you need to just get it all in place whereas if I knit a yoke it's all kind of evened out because I hadn't been doing magic loop or anything is this all spaced out on the circular needle and I think that's the reason why I do feel like stretching is sometimes necessary for things like short circumference things but I don't see it necessary on things where it was already hanging on the needles did that make sense? I hope that made sense. You can see why I didn't include that in the main gauge video because I'm kind of all over the place with that particular point. But it's something I find interesting to think about because blocking is still something I am wrapping my head around and it's interesting. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy the vlogist that I will be doing. I really do hope that you want to take part in this year's Serbian Mitten Club. If you have any questions at all about it, you can ask below, you can ask in the questions and answers group on Ravelry. We will be starting relevant threads for it, so that would also be a great place to take part in, to ask any questions about it. I'm gonna to try to share as much information as I can with regards to this club. Uh, and I'm really excited about it. And now the sun's gone behind a cloud, so I guess that's my call to wrap up this video. And if I won't see you next week, I will at least see you on the vloggist videos. So thank you so much for watching. Bye.